The book of Revelation, chapter 1. Uh, today's sermon, however you want to view it, is either part 2 of part 2 or part 3 of part 1, however you want to view it. The salient point is, I endeavored to give a sermon on the second coming of Jesus Christ a few weeks ago, and we're now in the third part of that. Didn't mean to do that, but there it is. And I had announced to you that I thought we'd be able to finish the book of Revelation in a year. We're behind schedule quite a bit now, so who knows? But that's okay. We're not in a big hurry. Hopefully Jesus comes back before we even finish it. Amen? Uh, so what we did a couple weeks ago was we, we read verses 7 and 8, which is where we are in the text, and we dealt with them very carefully. We pretty much did a word-by-word study of verses 7 and 8, and then that opened up some questions about the second coming that we started to address last week. Just three little questions. We only got through two of them. So this third week, we'll try to nail down the final bit. But let's just read sort of as a background the text that we began to deal with a couple weeks ago. Revelation chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, speaking of Jesus, it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and the way that it speaks to us. We thank you that though the future is uncertain and and even uh, hard to discern for us, even when we look at the biblical text, we thank you that we know, Jesus, that you hold the future in your hands, that you're sovereign and you're in control. You hold the fate of nations, the future of the whole world, of all of creation, of the entire universe. All things are held together by your word. Thank you, God. Sometimes our lives seem out of control. You're in control. Sometimes our present circumstances seem overwhelming. You're bigger than them. Sometimes it's even hard to deal with our past. You're faithful in your grace and your forgiveness and in giving us new beginnings. And there's coming a day where the whole of creation will have a new beginning and all things will be made brand new. Lord, we look forward to that day. Help us try to understand it, what your scriptures say about it. We know there's much that is unclear to us. We barely get the present. How can we nail the future? But help us where you can in your word. Please help me to teach and preach in a way that's faithful. And please enable us to live in faithful ways in light of your wonderful, glorious gospel and your glorious coming. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we started to ask these questions about the second coming last week in our study after dealing with the text of Revelation 1, 7, and 8. We asked the question, is it literal? Like, this is hard to wrap our sort of uh, Western minds around, but is Jesus literally, physically, actually going to come to earth? We, we answered that question, and emphatically, the answer is yes, according to Scripture. There's really not another way to view that, according to Scripture, if you take the biblical text seriously, as we do. Can I get an amen? Amen. So we dealt with that, and then we talked about when will it happen. That's really what everybody wants to know. Britt, spare me the details. Just tell me when is it going to happen. And we saw that that's not as simple of an answer as we may hope. You know, we talked about the rapture of the church and the difference, perhaps, between the rapture and the second coming, uh, the options as to the timing of that, how we ought to think about that, how those events differ and uh, how we ought to live in light of them. So we answered that question to the best of our ability. When will it happen? So the the final question was, what happens after? And that's what we're going to address this morning. What happens after the second coming of Jesus Christ? And you may be saying to yourself, well, why do I care? Why is that important? Is it when he comes again, like, that's it, and everything's over, and it's all done, and it's all dealt with, and I'm just trying to get there, man. Why do I care what happens after Jesus comes again? Well, there are some reasons why it's important. First of all, it's it's important that we think about what happens after Jesus comes again because it reveals to us and fulfills for us God's intent for the world. You see, we realize experientially something that Scripture tells us emphatically that this world is not the way it's supposed to be. That this world has been and is in many ways broken by sin. 
And that God intended and wants and desires something very different for our lives than the brokenness of sin. Something very different from the world than the way that we see evil functioning in the world. But we look around in the world and that can be difficult to deal with. And it's not God's intention is important to realize. And so the events that take place after Christ come again, after Christ comes again, excuse me, reveals to us and fulfills for us God's intent for the world. It has to do with kingdom consummation. The fact that we always talk about that when Jesus came the first time, the kingdom came with him. It was inaugurated. It began. It's already here. We're members of the kingdom. The reality of his kingdom is present and working in our lives. But the kingdom is also coming in its fullness. The second coming has to do with kingdom consummation. When all the promises of the kingdom will be fulfilled, right? It's not just inaugurated, it will be consummated. It was begun at the first coming, it will happen in fullness at the second coming and the results thereof that we'll speak about in a few moments. It doesn't only have to do with kingdom consummation, but it has to do with creation restoration, right? There is coming a day after Christ comes again when all things will be made brand new. And that's part of the Christian hope. That's part of the Christian hope. That's a, that's a different day. It's a different reality that we look forward to after Jesus comes again. It won't be in the world where there seems to be this ending stream of, of tyranny and, and fearful circumstances. If it's not a, a Hitler or Mussolini, it's a Al-Qaeda or an ISIS, right? If it's not cultural persecution, it's Christians actually being beheaded. If it's not people who are further along in age getting deadly diseases, it's eight-year-old kids that die of cancer. Things are horribly wrong. But the second coming teaches us about creation restoration, when everything that has gone wrong will be set right. Right? And all things will be made brand new. And that helps us persevere in days like this. Secondly, what happens after the second coming is important because it shows us the appropriate end to evil. That's a big deal because sometimes evil seems unending. And everybody has this question. I don't care what your theological background is. I don't care what you believe. Everybody has this question on their minds. If God is good and God is all-powerful, why evil? And why the outworkings of evil that we see in the world today? If God is all-powerful and God is really good, why the sort of political brokenness and evil that we see today? Why the disease and death that we see in our own lives? Why? And if you've ever pondered that question or studied that question, you know the answers to it are not that easy. But there is something that helps us tremendously. The events that take place after the second coming of Jesus teach us that there is an appropriate end to evil and its effects and its results. That Jesus really is going to deal with it finally and fully. That justice will be met. Everything that has gone wrong will ultimately be set right. And then thirdly then, what that shows us is what a world would look like when God gets his way. When Jesus comes again, God begins to get his way, so to speak, in the created realm. And that will show us then, the events after the second coming, what a world looks like when God gets his way, which will, fourth, show us how to live in this lifetime. If there's a clear picture of what the consummation of the kingdom and the restoration of creation look like, then we who are already members of his kingdom ought to endeavor to live in a way that's consonant with that that's faithful to that, that foreshadows that and reflects that, that looks forward to that, that shows of the reality of Jesus as king ruling and reigning on earth because he is king Jesus in my life right now as I struggle to live this life on earth. Shows us how to live and gives us something wonderful to hope in, the victory of Christ at his coming. So, What I'm going to try to do now is kind of illustrate this overall on the chalkboard. Last week, I went to the chalkboard for the first time ever in the history of the church. Was that helpful? Was it helpful, a little visual stuff? So I'm going to do that again and just try to kind of lay it out. Now, here's a a disclaimer. 
Any question that comes up in the book of Revelation, there are at least three good perspectives on it, right? There's any question that comes up, there's at least three perspectives, and then there's all sorts of nuances within those perspectives. I don't have the brain, we don't have the time to talk about all the different perspectives. So I'm going to kind of just lay it out today from my perspective. Is that okay? Okay, we already talked about the fact that you don't have to agree with me and we can still be cool. Okay, if you find in your heart that you have a different perspective on eschatology, the study of end times, how it all unfolds than I do, and you start to get creepy in your heart about that, like, oh, I hate Brit, you're kind of blowing it. And vice versa. If you disagree with my eschatological perspective, I'm like, ah, that guy's an idiot. I'm blowing it. These are secondary issues, okay? We can have civil discussion. We can write books back and forth. We can argue about it, but we don't like get bummed with each other about it. Cool? Make sense? So I'm going to lay it out from a pre-tribulational view of the rapture and pre-millennial view of the second coming. Pre-trib, we talked about that last week. I think that the uh, rapture of the church happens before the tribulation, right? God's wrath poured out on earth. There are other views. There's a mid-trib view and the post-trib view. Good arguments on those. I'm just gonna lay out how I see it right now. And then a premillennial return of Christ, meaning that he returns before the thousand-year reign, the millennial kingdom spoken of in Revelation chapter 20 that we'll look at in a few moments. There are other views, excellent views, Right, there's an amillennial view that there's not really a literal thousand years that we live in the millennium now. There's a postmillennial view that the gospel will conquer on the earth to such a degree that all of culture will be swayed to look very much how God intends and then after that, Christ will come back. Good views, great arguments, not mine, okay? Mine is pre-trib, postmillennial. But I'm open to discussion, secondary issues. Now, some of you are saying, okay, wow, we're only like a few minutes into this sermon and this is TMI, way too much information. (laughs) Others of you are savvy on this kind of stuff and you're students and you're like, well, Britt, I mean, what does that mean that you're premillennial? What sort of premillennial are you? Are you a dispensationalist or are you a progressive dispensationalist? Are you a historic premillennial or are you a consistent holistic premillennial? Which one are you? Forget about it. Can we just keep it simple for a minute? Okay, so this is a pre-trib and pre, ooh, can he spell millennial on the spot? Two L's, two N's, pre-millennial perspective. As we did last week, we'll just start with a cross which represents the life and ministry of Jesus, okay? A couple thousand years ago. God bless you. And then we're going to draw a squiggly line because a squiggly squiggly line as opposed to a straight line represents an undetermined period of time, all right? And then we're going to put at the end here what we might call eternity or we'll just call it new, okay? We'll make it look shiny and new by putting that around it. So that's when... The new heavens and the new earth happens, which everyone would agree that's eternity. That's the, that's the final state. Okay, so we're going from the cross to the new heavens and the new earth, the eternal state. How might we fill that in? Well, after the cross comes a period of time in which, oh, I should make that a little bigger. How are you guys doing in the back? Can you see? Depends on your age, huh? So this period of time from the ministry of Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ until now is called the church age. That's the period of time in which we live, okay? A pre-tribulational view of the rapture would say that the church age would sort of come to an end when the rapture takes place, which you'll remember from last week is an upward movement of the church to be caught up in the sky, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord, comfort one another with these words, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says. So that's the rapture. We'll just put a big R there, okay? The rapture of the church. We talked about the difference between the rapture and the second coming last week. If you weren't here last week, you really need to get that tape. After the rapture then, we see this period of time, many would say seven years, 
the tribulation period, okay? We'll represent it with a T. So the tribulation period, among other things, is God pouring out his wrath on an unrepentant world. It's also the wrath of Satan unleashed on the world. But because it's God's wrath on an unrepentant world, I wouldn't expect that the church would be present for it because those of us that have put our faith in Jesus Christ have already had Jesus take God's wrath for our sins, and been forgiven. So we're not looking for a double wrath thing. So I think that we're out of here before the tribulation period. Not everyone agrees. That's okay. Don't worry about it. After then the tribulation period, we read this last week in Revelation chapter 19, is the second coming of Jesus Christ, which you'll remember is a downward movement of Christ with those who are is coming to the earth to establish his kingdom, right? So we'll just put a second there to represent that. So the church age, the rapture of the church, caught up in the clouds, meet the Lord in the sky, be with the Lord. Tribulation unfolds on earth. We're with the Lord or we're going through it, depending on your perspective. Christ returns. After Jesus returns, here comes the premillennial thing. Is this period of time a thousand years? Perhaps representative of a long period of time, perhaps a literal time period. So we'll put 1K right there. That's the millennial kingdom. Jesus ruling and reigning on earth. His body is saints ruling with him from Jerusalem on King David's throne, the scriptures seem to say, okay? God beginning to get his way on earth. After the thousand year period, also Revelation chapter 20, comes something that we'll represent with the sideways view of a chair, which represents a throne. Okay, you see that throne? That's the great white throne. You want to fill it in so it's white? Make it real pretty? There you go. White. The great white throne judgment where evil, wickedness is dealt with once and for all. Even death and Hades are judged. Okay, this is the final judgment. And that would lead us into then all evil and sin having been dealt with once before at that judgment, new heavens and new earth. Does that make sense? Yeah? Is that clear enough? Can you see that? Is that helpful to any degree? Okay. No, I'm not looking for applause. I just want to know if that's, that's helpful. Church age, rapture of the church, tribulation period, Jesus comes again, establishes his thousand year reign on earth. That's a premillennial perspective. Great white throne judgment. This gets a little squished here. New heaven and new earth, eternity. Now, the way that we begin to see this unfold in Scripture is in the Old Testament, of course. The Old Testament is full of predictions of a future kingdom in which God will set up on earth his everlasting dominion. We see this all throughout the Old Testament. A future kingdom that God will set up on earth which will be everlasting in duration and physical in nature. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed and that kingdom will not be left for other people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. Speaking of kingdoms that were on earth, so we're speaking of physicality, okay, a physical kingdom, but it itself will endure forever. So the Old Testament hope is that one day God will set up a kingdom on earth that'll be greater than all the other kingdoms and unlike the kingdoms of the world which rise and fall, as history goes by, this will be an everlasting, enduring kingdom, okay? God ruling and reigning, finally getting his way on earth. That is spoken of over and over again in the Old Testament. I think we could all agree that it hasn't happened yet, right? We're talking about a world filled with God's righteousness is the way that we read it in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 last week. Now, this kingdom is what we might refer to as the messianic kingdom, the promised messianic kingdom. And what's important to realize about the messianic kingdom is that it has to do with Israel. Okay, the promises were, give, were given excuse me, initially to Israel. Jesus was Israel's Messiah. He is the Messiah, the Savior of the whole world, but he was first Israel's Messiah. And the messianic kingdom and the promises thereof and its physicality and its presence on earth and its duration were first given to Israel through the Jewish prophets. Jeremiah, for example, shows us that it has to do with Israel. 
The day will come, says the Lord, when I will do for Israel and for Judah all the good things I have promised them. In those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. Speaking of the Messiah that would come, Jesus. He will do what is just and right throughout the land. In that day, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this will be its name. The Lord is our righteousness. For this is what the Lord says. David will have a descendant sitting on the throne of Israel forever. So it was expected in Israel that Messiah would come. He'd set up a kingdom that was the kingdom of God. It would have physicality. It would be in this time-space continuum. It would have dominion over any other kingdom in the world. And it would have duration. It would last forever. But it would have to do with the throne of David. Right? Jesus was a, a descendant of David. And he'll sit on the throne of David, who is kind of the ultimate archetype of the king in Israel. Jesus will fulfill that. So the coming kingdom in its fullness has to do in part at least with the restoration of Israel. These are Israel's promises. But the book of Romans tells us we're grafted into these promises as non-Jews, if you will, as Gentiles, if there are any of those here, right? As Gentiles, we've been grafted into the promises which had to do with the gospel, the kingdom, and the Messiah that were for Israel. We've been brought into those. That's why Jesus told his Jewish disciples, go preach the gospel to all the nations, right? It has to do with Israel, but it is intended for and has an effect on the whole world. It's not intended merely for the whole world instead of Israel. We are brought into the promises of Israel, and God still has a plan for Israel to reveal the Messiah to them. So then the next point is the kingdom is effective for the whole world, Daniel chapter 7. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. This is a prophecy about Jesus, son of man, his favorite title for himself. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that the people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Right, that's what we see taking place in the book of Revelation. We see the kingdom of this world becoming the kingdom of our God. And we see that it includes every tongue, tribe, and nation. Revelation chapter 7, we get a vision of heaven and there's every tongue, tribe, and nation around the throne enjoying the promises given to Israel by which we've been grafted in through the gospel of Jesus Christ and have now become partakers in. So this kingdom has to do with Israel, but it's effective for the whole world, sovereignty over all the nations. And it's really a fulfillment of the deal, the covenant that God made with Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12, right? He said to Abraham, I'm gonna bless you. From you will come, he promised the Messiah. Through you, through the Messiah, I'm gonna bless the nations and I will give you an everlasting land. So that promise had to do with the coming of the Messiah, it had to do with the blessing of the nations, and it had to do with national Israel. All those things are being fulfilled in one way or another in the second coming of Jesus Christ and the setting up of the kingdom. It has to do with Israel, it affects and is for the whole world, and the kingdom is ruled by King Jesus. Right? The Old Testament prophets told us that the Messiah would be the one who rules. Isaiah chapter 9, here's our Christmas verse. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Who is this talking about? Jesus. Jesus. Good job. <laughs> verse 7, there will be no end to the increase of his government. Right? Messianic prophecy, there's coming a child, God in the flesh, he'll have a kingdom which will never end. Then it says, or of his peace, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So it was expected that when this kingdom of God came on earth, in its physicality, fulfilling promises to the Jews, 
for the good of the whole world through the gospel, that the king at the center of this kingdom would be Jesus. This is what the angel announced when he told Mary about the child she would have. Gabriel to Mary in Luke 1. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Okay, that's how the first coming of Jesus began. The announcement from the angel to Mary that there's going to be a fulfillment of this promise of a son through a virgin, that he will have a kingdom. It'll be a specific kingdom. It'll be David's old kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. That he'll be the king there and he'll set it up and he'll rule and he'll reign forever. That's how the first coming begins. And then when Jesus begins his ministry, what does he come doing? He comes preaching the good news of the kingdom. That's what we hear Jesus saying, right? That's what we even hear John the Baptist saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the first thing Jesus ever says. Repent for the kingdom has come near to you. He doesn't explain kingdom. He expects it as Jewish hearers will understand what he means by kingdom because they've heard the Old Testament prophecies. They know what their prophet said, that there's coming a day where God will, where God will establish on earth in physicality, over other kingdoms, his own kingdom. It'll be governed at the center by one who will sit on the throne of David, and this is Messiah the King, Jesus. And he will establish his righteous rule on earth. Jesus begins his ministry by saying, you better get right, the kingdom is near. Doesn't explain it, because they get it. This ancient promise to Israel that affects the whole world is beginning to come true. The first coming is the inauguration of the kingdom. And at the first coming, the spiritual components of the kingdom are brought to us. This is very important because the ancient promises of Israel included things like the forgiveness of sins, a new heart being given to God's people, his spirit being poured out on God's people, all of these spiritual promises that pertain to the kingdom, a core component of it, are fulfilled at the first coming of Jesus Christ through his cross, right, his death, and his resurrection, the forgiveness of sins. Us being made brand new through putting our faith in the gospel. The spirit being given to believers and poured out on the church. And what Jesus did in his first coming besides achieve the spiritual components of it, is demonstrate the future physical reality of it. Every time Jesus was casting out a demon, he was announcing, in the fullness of my kingdom, there will be no demonic activity. There will be no evil when my kingdom has come in fullness. Every time he healed someone, he was saying, when my kingdom comes in fullness, there'll be no more sickness, there'll be no more death. Whenever he calmed the winds or the wave, he was saying there is coming a day where creation will not be out of control, but it will be subject to my good, righteous kingship. All of those activities of Jesus' ministry pointed to were displays of, foreshadows of, tastes of, experiences of the coming kingdom of God which came with Christ, but will come in fullness when he comes again. And Jesus set that up. His single longest discourse in all the gospels, the thing that he took the most time to talk about in Matthew 24 was his return to sit on his glorious throne and judge evil and the nations and every single person. And that's what we're looking forward to. Jesus coming again. And what it will bring is something that is incredibly elusive to the world. Universal peace. I mean, what's the whole world trying to figure out right now? Right? How, how, do, we, how, do, we, how do we bring peace to this big ball spinning in the sky? How do we deal with the situation in the Middle East? How do we do, deal with China? How do we deal with the home front? 
How do we deal with our neighborhoods? How do we deal with our inner cities? How do we deal with the geopolitical situations? How do we, do we deal with tsunamis and earthquakes? How do we deal with kids who get cancer? How do we deal with Ebola? These things will be dealt with when Christ comes again. That's the promise of the kingdom. Turn to the prophet Isaiah. Keep a finger here in the book of Revelation. Turn to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. We'll see one of these promises of this kingdom given to Israel, effectual for the whole world, Messiah the King at the center, changing everything, yet to come. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1, the word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem has to do with Israel. Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it and many peoples will come. Has to do with Israel, effectual for the whole world. Verse 3, they'll say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Right? Sitting on David's throne, ruling and reigning. Look at verse 4. This should sound familiar to you. And he, Messiah the king, will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many people. And they population of the earth, will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. So there's a promise of a day of worldwide peace as it pertains to war and violence. If, if maybe you've heard, that that part of it, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, is on the wall that's out front of the UN building in New York City. That's kind of their preferatory claim, right, of world peace. Never again will they learn war. They, the UN, left out the salient point. And he, Messiah the King, will judge between the nations and render decisions for many people. Poor UN. They are endeavoring to do what only King Jesus could ever do, which is bring a worldwide righteous peace. The promise of God is that there's coming a day when that will be the reality. Physicality. Political implications, worldwide kingdom implications. And it also has implications for creation in general. Turn to Isaiah chapter 11 now, as we see another one of these corresponding promises. They're everywhere in the Old Testament. We're just looking at a couple. Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Again, a messianic prophecy about Jesus. Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, right? Talking about David and his descendants. And the branch from his roots will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear, like people do, but with righteousness He will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. We saw that last week in Revelation 19, verse 21. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt around his loins and faithfulness the belt around his waist. Finally, the world will have a ruler who's righteous and faithful. Verse 6, look at how everything changes. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the leopard will lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. 
The young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand in the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Look at this. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Look at those promises. Right now, we have to contend for the faith, for the knowledge of the Lord. Culture doesn't want to hear it. The world doesn't want to hear it. So much of the world hasn't heard it. But when Christ comes to establish kingdom, the whole world will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. The whole world will be full of his truth and his righteousness. And everything will change. Not only will humans hammer their swords into plowshares and not make war anymore, but even the environment will change. Right? It's not going to be about predator and prey anymore. It's going to be about peace and harmony. That may just be imagery. It may be actually that the lion eats straw. I don't know. But the point is, when God gets his way, everything in the world that smacks of rebellion, violence, death, chaos, evil, pain, and suffering is dealt with. This is incredibly good news. And this begins to unfold. God begins to get his way in that way after he comes again in what is known as the millennial kingdom, the fulfillment of the messianic kingdom. We see that in Revelation chapter 20. Go back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. Now, last week we saw in Revelation 19 the second coming of Jesus. We looked at that. Verse 11 kind of captures it all. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True. So we saw the second coming of Jesus Christ last week in Revelation 19. Now as we move into Revelation 20, we see the fulfillment, I believe, of this messianic kingdom, this thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on earth. So we're going to read the first 10 verses of Revelation 20. Listen. It's going to create as many questions as it answers in our minds. When we get to chapter 20 in about 20 years, we'll deal with each one carefully. For now, I just want you to capture the spirit of how things begin to change when Christ returns in fulfillment of the ancient prophecies. Okay, verse 20, or excuse me, chapter 20, verse 1. Jesus has just returned, and now it says, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Already this seems like a good thing, right? Come on. Verse 3, And threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. Wait a minute, just stop right there for a moment. Just begin to imagine a world where Satan is fully bound that he might not work deception. No political deception. No moral deception. No ideological deception. No no theological deception, no philosophical deception, no deception about our sexuality, no deception about our possessions and our relationships and our hearts and our minds. Begin to imagine a a world free from the work of Satan. This is already looking good, right? After the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then it gets a little hairy after that. It says, until the thousand years were completed, after these things, he must be released for a short time. We'll get to that in a moment. I'll try to explain. But look what verse 4 says. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. Okay, this is kingdom talk, right? This is a kingdom coming in fullness. There's thrones, and there's judgment. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God. I mean, it just blows my mind that people are being beheaded in our world right now for their testimony about Jesus. And there it is. And it's all the souls of those who have been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark upon their forehead and upon their hand. And they came to life. 
So those who in this tribulation period lose their lives because of the persecution that will be unleashed on the world at that time because of their faith in Jesus Christ, when he comes again, they are resurrected. Okay, they receive their glorified bodies that they might, it says, reign with Christ for a thousand years. So remember, from my perspective, when Jesus returned, his church, those who were already part of his church before the tribulation, returned with him. The dead in Christ rose first at the rapture. We who are alive and remain were caught up to meet him in the sky and we were changed. We got our glorified bodies, marriage supper of the lamb in heaven during the tribulation period. We return with him. And after that, those, and it will be many, who lost their lives trying to be witnesses for Christ in the tribulation period will be resurrected. We joined with them. And now we begin to reign with Christ fulfilling that New Testament promise that we see over and over again, that when he comes into his kingdom, those who are his will rule and reign with him. That's why James and John went up to Jesus and said, Jesus, here's the deal. And one gospel account even has their mama saying it for them. Here's the deal, Jesus. When you come into your kingdom, let my boys James and John rule and reign with you. One sit at your right, one sit at your left. They got it wrong. They were a little uppity, a little excited about themselves, a little presumptuous there. But Israel understood, and the church understands, that when Jesus reigns, we who are his reign with him. Not that we're big shots, but that we serve him. It's a kingdom. He's a king. He'll have those who do his will. We'll serve him in that way. Verse 5 now. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection, talking about the resurrection in verse 4 of those who were killed during the tribulation period. The rest of the dead is a reference to the wicked dead. Remember, Christian doctrine says this, that the wicked and the righteous alike are resurrected. The righteous, those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, are resurrected to eternal life, and the wicked are resurrected to judgment and eternal separation from God. That's a reference to that. We'll see it as we move through the chapter in a moment. Verse six. Blessed and holy is the one who is, has a part in the first resurrection. Over these things, the second death, eternal separation from God, has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, now it said reigning a thousand years, about a thousand times. And it may be that it's a literal thousand years, but there's a lot of figurative numbers happening in Revelation. It may just represent a long time. Some people think it's this time, the amillennial perspective. Some people think it's before Jesus returns, the post-millennial perspective. He returns post a millennium happening. Right? But I think it happens after Revelation 19. Jesus has come back, establishes his kingdom. It's a thousand years or a long time, if that's what that represents. And we're ruling and reigning with him. Then, verse 7, and when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will come out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. That's good news. Let me just read it again. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. Next time the devil reminds you about your horrific past, you remind him about his horrific future. <laughs> Where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Stop right there. Jesus returns. Satan is bound. Kingdom is set up. Those who are his are ruling and reigning with him. It's a thousand years or a long time. Satan is released, depending on your perspective, that's either figurative or a literal thing. I think it's a literal thing. And you say, why? Stuff was going so well. Why would God let him be released for a time? Well, I'm not exactly sure, but I, I think it might have something to do with this. In doing that, God proves once and for all that he alone is right and righteous and that humanity is culpable and susceptible to sin. God's been kind of proving this all along. You know what sort of modern uh, humanistic philosophy says? It says we're basically good. And if you just get us in the right environment, we will act good. But what about the fact that man was first placed in a perfect garden? 
and sinned there in a perfect environment. You see, it's not our environment that causes us to be sinful. It's something else altogether. And then God establishes his nation and says, I will be a king over the nation. And they say, well, we'd rather have a king than we could see. And in that, they fall into all sorts of idolatry and they fall away from the Lord and commit abominations over and over again. And so God comes in the flesh, Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, to show forth his righteousness. He's born of a virgin to fulfill the prophecy, lives a perfect sinless life. And what do they do with him? They kill him, they crucify him. Rises from the dead. Ascends into heaven, sends his Holy Spirit on the church and into the world to work in the world. And still, with all this, there's rampant rebellion against God. And so he'll start to pour out his wrath on the world unchecked. He'll send warning signs. You're part of it. Preaching the gospel now, that's part of it. There'll be an angel that flies around mid-heaven, the visible sky, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ as this wrath is being unleashed on the world. And still people will say, I don't want anything to do with God. Jesus will come again on the clouds with great glory. Every eye will see him. Unmistakable at that point that this guy must be the real deal. Bind Satan, ruling and reigning physically from earth. The moment Satan is released, we see again rebellion against God. You see, by the time we get to the judgment, which is the next verse, God has proven himself over and over again to be the only righteous and true one and that humanity really needs a savior. This is proven once and for all. And what's proven once and for all in the physical, in the physical realm is that Jesus is truly Lord of lords and King of kings. You know, right now, we, we kind of see that by faith. We believe that now. It's what the scriptures say, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 will come up later. It says this, He, God, raised him, Jesus, from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, at his right hand, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put, past tense, he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. This is a reality of Jesus Christ now. It's not that Jesus Christ will one day be king of kings and lord of lords. He is now. But that is not always tangible in this world. We believe it by faith. We try to live our lives according to the kingship of Jesus Christ. But the second coming is the full outworking of that lordship. At the second coming, his kingship will be public, complete, and universal in this world, is what Revelation is saying. Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. That's what's happening through the book of Revelation is the fullness of this kingdom is beginning to unfold, particularly here in Revelation chapter 20. And then we'll have the fulfillment of this wonderful verse, Philippians chapter 2. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, it's important that we know what happens after the second coming of Jesus Christ because it has to do with the whole world. There's physicality to it. There's political reality to it. It affects the way that things are. And if Jesus is truly Messiah the King, then that has to be how it is. His kingship has to be seen on earth because the promise to the Jews was that one day God will set up his kingdom on earth and it will have a king and it will be tangible and visible and effectual. And that is fulfilled after the second coming of Jesus Christ. The messianic reign within human history is necessitated by careful Christology. Jesus is the king who must be shown as such to the world. And then after that comes this. What was that again? I know it's sloppy. 
Great white throne judgment. Let's read it. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence the earth and the heaven fled away, and no place was found for him, for them. Excuse me, for them. And I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. That doesn't sound good. We talk about Santa Claus keeping a list, blah, blah, blah. Listen, don't don't think that evil goes unnoticed in the world. And don't think that yours goes unnoticed. God keeps record of our evil deeds. And there are two places where he will deal with those. Either at the cross of Jesus Christ when you put your faith in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross or at the great white throne judgment where you will stand before the only righteous one and answer for what is written in the book. No third option. He won't be grading on a curve. He'll be grading according to his righteousness. That's why we preach the gospel. We don't want anybody, anybody to have to stand before the great white throne when they could stand before the risen Savior now and be forgiven now. All of our deeds are written in the books. But the book of Colossians tells us that at the cross, Jesus blotted out did away with the certificate of deeds which was hostile to us, removed it as far as the east is from the west, buried it in the deepest sea. Our sins are forgiven. If we reject that work of Jesus Christ, then the only choice is the great white throne because God will deal with rebellion and wickedness and sin. And this is where he does it. And so it says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. And death and Hades, here's the final victory, here's the final enemy, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. That's what we would technically, or popularly, I should say, call hell, eternal separation from God. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into into the lake of fire, the Lamb's book of life, by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Here we have God once and for all dealing with evil and all of its effects, all things being judged, God being shown to be the righteous one to whom all of humanity through all of the ages will answer. This is a terrible day. This is a wonderful day. This is a terrible day. This is a wonderful day. We don't want anyone to get to the throne of judgment. We want everyone to come to the cross of Christ. Preach the gospel. And after this then comes eternity. And this is the best part. Chapter 21, verse 1. Here's where we end. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. New heaven and new earth. We see that all through the book of Isaiah and other Old Testament prophecies. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. It doesn't mean we won't be surfing. Sea is a Jewish idiom for separation between people. At least that's what I keep telling myself. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne be saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. No more separation between God and those who are his. And now look, verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are faithful and true. This, brothers and sisters, is what the world looks like when God gets his way. This is God's intention for 
creation fully and finally realized through recreation and through the consummation of the kingdom, through the ultimate dealing of evil. And what this does is give us wonderful joy because there's an appropriate end to evil as we see it manifest in the world. And what it does is give us glorious hope because there's coming a day where all that has gone wrong will be set right by Christ himself. And we can look forward to the day and it gives us tremendous perseverance because the way that it is now, though it feels like it will never end, it will end one day feels like it's just a succession of evil and failure and disappointment and loss and pain. But that will not carry the day. King Jesus, the Messiah, who makes all things new, will carry the day. We need this hope. We need this truth. But because before, I think, the New Testament says, before it all goes down, our world's going to get even a little scarier even a little more difficult. Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilence, rampant persecution. But then he said about these things, you know, they're only birth pains. He called them birth pains. I'm going to take the road of humility here because I'm a man. I know nothing about birth pains. I know nothing. But I know this. After my wife recently birthed our baby girl and held that new life. Birth pains are just a distant memory. They're not even relevant anymore. In fact, she's willing to do it again. (laughs) Because the glory and wonder of new creation so far outweighs the pain and travail of it coming. And there'll come a day, all this pain, all this death, all this mourning will just be, I'd I'd even do it again, to experience the glory of Christ in his new creation. They're just birth pains. Hold on, the king is coming. Amen? Amen? Thank you, Lord, for this. Go ahead. Thank you, Lord, for this glorious truth. We just ask now for grace to live it out. Grace to live it out. We we see that you're the faithful and true witness who is coming again. We want to live faithful lives for you. Lord, I would confess that so often I find myself living for lesser things for temporal things that don't matter and won't matter. Help us, Lord, to live for you. And help us now to show a really broken world what the kingdom looks like, what forgiveness and hope and restoration and renewal and what making all things new looks like. You've already made us new. We are already made new through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to live new lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. Lord, that you would fill your church with your spirit to live obedient, faithful, fruitful lives. That you'd give us grace to be willing to live our lives for your cause and your purposes and not just my stuff. You're the one who gave his life for us. You're the risen king who rules and reigns and is coming again. You're good and you're awesome. Thank you for your grace upon our lives. Help us to rejoice in it and to live according to it. In Jesus' name, amen.